Hey everyone, this is John Buck, and I'm uh, back with another discrete time linear systems video. Tonight we're going to talk about one of the really uh, big picture cool ideas in discrete time signal processing, which is the idea that we can take a continuous signal, sample it, filter it into discrete time, and then and then go back to continuous time and have the whole overall system act like a continuous time filter, an effective continuous time filter. Uh, we're going to break this up into two videos uh, to talk about what's happening, but it's putting together a bunch of the pieces we've seen this semester. The ideas of sampling and interpolation from last time, uh, along with filtering from earlier in the Fourier transform chapter. So let's see how we can, can put these pieces together uh, to build a system that we use all the time in real life applications. All right, so again, our topic for tonight is discrete time processing of continuous time signals. Uh, and the big picture idea is we're going to analyze the system I've drawn here where we take a continuous time signal, sample it to get a discrete time signal we'll call xd of n, filter it with a discrete time LTI filter to get an output in discrete time, and then go back to continuous time overall. A couple important points uh, I should mention before we go on just to keep notation straight uh, for, this, uh, for this topic uh, is we're going to have, have to use different variables for the two frequencies to keep them straight. So in continuous time we'll have our frequency We'll use the little omega for continuous time to, in this lecture. All right, so we'll have our input will be xc of j little omega. Our, our idea is to find an overall continuous time filter, effective filter, like this, like hc of j little omega. And then for discrete time, we're going to use a frequency that's big omega. And so our input will have a Fourier transform x sub d e to the j big omega. And our discrete time filter, like I've already drawn it there, is h sub d of e to the j omega. So I'm using those sub d's to remind me what's discrete. Uh, but if I sort of, like a lot of things we've seen this semester, this will be easier to think about what's actually going on in the frequency domain. Uh, That's why we've been putting in all this time and effort to get the Fourier transform under control. So I have a continuous time input spectrum. We saw some last time how these are related. We get a discrete time Fourier transform for the input, another one for the output, and then eventually we get a continuous time Fourier transform for the output. And the big picture idea here is that if I think about it, or what we want to analyze is say, well, this whole overall system here is acting like some effective continuous time filter, right, that I put in, as long as there's no aliasing, I'm putting a continuous time signal in, getting a continuous time signal out, so it has to act like some overall filter, and we want to understand how the continuous time filter, which I guess I, I uh, called below hc of j little omega for continuous time, is how that continuous time filter depends on the discrete time filter inside it, and also the sampling period t. All right, so this is our, our big picture goal for today. We're going to, uh, in this video, talk about the sampling part and show an example, uh, possibly in a separate video. Uh, and then we'll take on the filtering and reconstruction in the next video. All right, so we saw uh, last time the idea that we can start the sampling. The main idea of sampling, whether we have aliasing or not, comes from this part in the time domain where we multiply by a pulse train. And then the last piece, just to get to discrete time, is this idea that that the uh, discrete time outputs oops, will be the continuous time outputs, or sorry, the continuous time inputs every t seconds. So I've renormalized, divided the time axis by t. And, and it's sort of helpful to see what's going on here in sort of a side-by-side -side view, right, that we're starting out with some xc of t that looks like this. And so this is my time side. And here we have a frequency side. And we're going to assume, for this to be able to work without aliasing, we're going to assume my input signal is band limited. Right, so it's centered at zero. It has some maximum frequency in continuous time, little omega sub m. Right, so I have this band-limited Fourier transform in frequency. And then when I get to the next step to find xp of t, 
right? I've got sort of the same, trying to draw the same signal here. But what's going on here is that in fact, I should have drawn this as a uh, dashed line, right? So this is, this signal is sort of an, an envelope. But by the time I've multiplied by those pulse trains, Right, it's going on like this. So 0, t, 2, t, 3, t, where the height at each time has been scaled by the original continuous time signal. And we saw the effect of doing this on the frequency side was multiplying with the impulse train here, was convolving with this Fourier tra transform, which was another impulse train. So by the time I finish that, I'm putting copies here at omega s, which we saw was equal to 2 pi over t, right? So I'm convolving with these impulses that are spaced every 2 pi over t. And as long as omega s is more than twice omega m, I don't have aliasing, right? And that's the key idea. That means I could get everything back eventually, right? And the other important thing we saw here, <clears throat> right, is this left edge, as omega s minus omega m. So I need that to be above omega m is where we got the Nyquist theorem. So that's what we covered last time. And this is the main idea because this will tell us if there's aliasing or not. Oh, and the other piece is that all these have heights 1 over t. But then the last piece, to really make this discrete time, it shouldn't be every t. We've, we've emphasized all along, right, that for discrete time signals, things are integers in time. So this would actually be uh, say uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, extending out in each direction. And so not surprisingly, we've seen enough of these reciprocal relations that if I, if I divide by t in time, I'm going to multiply the omega axis, the frequency axis, by t. And so when I'm done, well, 0 is still 0, but the upper frequency is now omega mt minus omega mt. And this thing that was at 2 pi over t, let me get this out of my way, that was at 2 pi over t, well, when I multiply it by t, this becomes 2 pi. Right? So this new impulse is here, and then now this, this left edge this is my big omega axis for discrete time frequency. Similarly, this version over here. Is now centered at minus 2 pi. And this edge here is 2 pi minus omega mt, right? If this edge is minus omega mt, this one would be that far to the left. And again, as long as there's no aliasing, uh, there's a nice clean thing that doesn't overlap. So putting all that together, on the next page we can again come up with the three steps. We have uh, three steps to find the discrete time Fourier transform, so that's xd of e to the j big omega from the continuous time Fourier transform, xc of j omega. Right? And the first one is so you copy the original continuous time spectrum every omega s, right? That's 2 pi over t. Second one is not that important, but for completeness, we scale the height of all those copies by 1 over t. And then the third step, to convert to discrete time, we divide in time by t, so we multiply the frequency axis. And we multiply the omega, little omega frequency axis. by capital T to get the discrete time frequency 
which we're using big omega for today. And so we end up with this relationship that big omega is equal to little omega t, which sort of makes sense because this, in terms of if we think about the units, this makes sense because this is radians, right? Continuous time frequencies is radians per second and t is in seconds, right? So from that point of view, these cancel out, leaving me radians. So that's one of the things I always use as a sanity check as I think about what's in radians and what's radians per second. Okay, so I'm going to stop this video here, and then I'm going to go on. Uh, in the next video, I'll show an example of the first piece of the system. So again, we, what we've covered here is just the first section. We've taken this to here, but it's probably the most complicated. So in the next video, I'll show that an example of doing this in frequency, and then the video after that will go on and show the filtering and reconstruction. All right, that's all for now. I'll see you in the next video.